Okay, hello guys for the third and final time today. I'm sure you're all tired of having to look at me by now, but you're almost done. Um, it's also a really beautiful day outside. I'm filming this on Sunday and I kind of want to go outside. So I'm going to make sure this doesn't last too long. Okay, let's talk about some analysis of Mama Day. Also, how did you guys feel about the ending? Um, I have obviously read this novel before, so I knew what was going to happen, but I just had so many emotions <laughs> as I was sitting reading the ending again. I was just like, Gloria Naylor, the girl does not pull her punches. She goes straight for the jugular. Okay. Let's talk about some analysis though. So again, please turn to the pages that I point out to you guys. Uh, so let's go first to pages 262 through 263. Okay. Do, do, do. <clears throat> um, so this portion is... Uh, has Mama Day gone to the house yet? Yes, um, I believe Mama Day is already out at the other place. She's hanging out um, in the house out there, the old Day family home. Um, and she's kind of going over family trauma, which becomes really, it's been important throughout the text, but it becomes really hyper important here at the end, because it's part of something that George ends up having to struggle with as he's trying to save Coco. So let me read this bit. I'm going to start with um, the first full paragraph on page 262, and I'm just going to read to the top of page 263 where there's that little break. Miranda rocks in a rocking chair and thinks of the things she can make grow, the joy she got from any kind of life. Can't nothing be wrong in bringing on life, knowing how to get under, around, and beside nature to give it a slight push. Most folks just don't know what can be done with a little will in their own hands. But she ain't never lured, she ain't never tried to get over nature. Hadn't she seen enough in this very house to know that that couldn't be? John Paul would have moved the earth for his wife, but with all of them lifelike carvings, he couldn't give her peace. And Abigail, trying to form with her flesh what daddy couldn't form from wood, still couldn't get peace to live again. There is things you can do and things you can't, Miranda thinks, looking into the fire, and there's more sorrow coming. The rocker stops. No point in asking where the last thought came from. No point in trying to tell herself it ain't so. She could now tell herself whatever she wanted. She could fling herself into that fire, but nothing could stop that front door from opening and them footsteps moving toward the parlor. The baby girl is sick, little mama. That is... Um, <clears throat> Uh, Abigail speaking to her sister Mama Day. Miranda don't look at her sister in the parlor door. She keeps staring into the fire. It's a huge hearth because it's an old house. She grew up seeing them rusted hooks empty over the mantel, but when the time came, she knew what they were for. They hold her dried bundles of rosemary, thyme, woodruff, and linden flowers, her chamomile and verbena. She makes her medicine from those and many others layered in clay jars inside the pantry, but Abigail wouldn't set foot in the other place for that. So Miranda is staring past her dried herbs, past the birth of hope and grace, past the mother who ended her life in the sound, then on to the mother who began the days. She sees one woman leave by wind, another leave by water. She smells the blood from the broken hearts of the men who they cursed for not letting them go. She reaches up and touches her own tears. Miranda lets them fall. She wouldn't have the strength for them later. She finally turns to face her sister. The weight of her soul reflected in the eyes that meet hers. It's going to take a man to bring her peace. And they all and all they had was that boy, that boy referring to George. Um, this is really interesting. As I started to read, I actually remembered um, that this is right after um, Bernice has come to the other place with little Caesar's body after his passing. Um, and Mama Day is kind of, she kind of questions in that first paragraph. They're like, what, what is natural? What does that mean? Have I ever tried to get over or around nature? We've discussed how Mama Day really taps into the natural world whenever she uses her magic. And so she starts to consider, did Chick have to die because I did something unnatural in making Bernice fertile enough 
to actually have a baby? Did I do something wrong? Am I a part of this tragic family history? This fam family history in which uh, none of the women in their family are able to achieve peace. And this is represented in the text by daughters whose names are peace and who die whenever they are quite young. So we know that Mama Day and Abigail had a younger sister who was named Peace and that she died. Um, we later learn that what happened is she fell down a well. Um, and then this caused their mother to commit suicide. Um, and then uh, Abigail, um, whenever she had a daughter, she, she had two. She had Grace, who was Coco's mother, and she had a daughter she named Peace after her lost sister. And that child died very young, too. And then Abigail had no peace, right? And this even goes back, um, Mama Day suggests, to, on to the mother who began the days, that there was no peace for her either. And that the men who have loved these women, Safira Wade, um, Miranda, or Mama Day, and Abigail's mother, whose name was also Ophelia, um, and uh, Grace, that they, the, the men who loved them were never quite able to save them and bring them peace. Now you're like, oh my god, we need men to save women? What? <laughs> sort of yes. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, though, right? It's that these these men aren't quite sure how to bring or help these women achieve peace because of this ongoing family trauma that stretches back to a slave past. And uh, now the potential solution is George. <laughs> Poor George. We see how he pays for being that solution. Um, okay, let's go ahead and look at Little Caesar's funeral, which I think is really interesting, and that's on pages 268 through 269. Okay, um, so I'm just going to read this section on 268 through 269 that is in between um, the, the parts with a little break. This is from George's perspective. <clears throat> so they, uh, we were at it again for only about an hour, working on the bridge, that is, after the storm, when they stopped working, almost in mass, but no one had given a signal, that I understood at least, it's time to go to the standing forth. I followed them through the fields and back of the stores at the bridge junction to a little wooden church, and what they meant was a funeral. No flowers, no music. People were coming from all directions, each dressed apparently in whatever they were wearing when they knew the time had come. The men who had been working on the bridge in dirty overalls with tar under their fingernails. Miss Rima in her blue smock from the beauty parlor. One woman with her hair shampooed and a towel around her head. Um, one had on a house coat and fuzzy slippers. Even Bernice and Ambush weren't in special clothes, but black wasn't needed to set them apart. We filed into the pews, facing the simple pine coffin set up in the front. The minister was there, but he had little to say. When the rustling and moving had quieted, he cleared his throat and said, Charles Kyle Duvall, 1981 to 1985, who is ready to stand forth? He sat back down, and for a while there was silence. And then Miss Rima got up and walked to the front of the church and stood looking down at the closed coffin. When I first saw you, she began. You were wearing a green bunting, being carried in your mama's arms. You had a little fuzzy patch of hair on your head, and your mouth was open to let out a squall. I guess you were hungry. When I see you again, she said, you'll be sitting at my dining table, having been invited to dinner with the rest of my prude. <clears throat> it went on like that, person after person, dry-eyed and matter-of-fact. The minister calling out, who is ready to stand forth? Someone had seen him in a stroller and would see him again in his own car. If they first saw him walking, they would see him running. Dr. Buzzard got up and had first seen him sucking away on a pacifier, and when he saw him again, he'd be more than ready for a handful of his special ginger candy, always addressing the coffin and sometimes acting as if they expected an answer back. You liked my toy whistles, didn't you? The owner of the general store asked him. Well, when I see you again, you'll be buying my silver earrings for a sweetheart of yours. Why did I get the feeling that this meeting wasn't meant to take place inside of any building? The church, the presence of the minister, were concessions, and obviously the only ones they were going to make to a Christian ritual that should have called for a sermon, music, tears, the belief in an earthly finality for the child's life. His parents weren't crying, and I could have cut Ambush's grief with a knife. 
He was the next to rise. You were bunching your fists, angry and small. And I thought I had a fighter on my hands. A golden glove champ, maybe. And when I see you again, you'll be fighting for the place you deserve among other great men. Surely, Bernice couldn't take part in this. The woman had gone out of her mind when that child died. But she also stood up, trembling. Her voice could barely be heard, and she turned to the coffin with an air, could it be, of apology. When I first saw you, you were so very glad to be alive, new and declaring it to everyone. And when I see you again, you'll be forgiving of your old mamma, who didn't remember for a moment that you were still here. And that was it. It only took two men to carry the coffin because it was so small. It was laid into the open grave that was waiting behind the church and covered up. They began to disperse as calmly as they came. I stood there immobile by the fresh grave, trying to sort out the meaning of all this in my mind. Dr. Brothers' calloused hand applied gentle pressure to my arm. Come on, he said. We got us a bridge to build. Um, so the significance, and George really lays this out for us, is that this is not the typical kind of funeral. Um, especially, I mean, it's a it's occurring in a Christian place of worship inside of church, and, and the reverend is there, and he's kind of like helping to direct things by saying uh, who is next to stand forth. But George is like, this is a ceremony that isn't actually supposed to take place indoors. Um, so if you think about the meaning of that, you might say, well, okay, then it's supposed to take place outside. What's outside? The natural world. Willow Springs is what is outside. This is a kind of ritual for the community that is really tied to the unique place and space of Willow Springs. And it's also really interesting um, and kind of beautiful that all of the inhabitants of the island come forth and say, here's where I first saw you, uh, little Caesar, and here's where I'm going to see you again in the future. Um, you can interpret this a lot of ways. How are they going to see him again if he's dead? It might be as a memory. Um, it might be as a kind of imagining or longing for him, or they might be referring to some kind of afterlife. The text isn't entirely clear about what this means, um, but instead of a kind of mourning ritual, uh, this becomes a kind of celebration almost and a looking forward to what little Caesar is going to do in his life. Um, and Bernice's part is really interesting because she says, I'm sorry that I thought you were gone for a minute. And you think, well, Little Caesar is gone. He's dead. Things are a little bit more complicated than that. If you've been paying attention at all to the novel, then you realize that Willow Springs is a very haunted place. It is haunted by the ghosts of the past, by what has happened in the past, by histories and by people that are gone, but whose presences are still felt. And the community recognizes this, and they're saying that Little Caesar has joined that kind of haunting history of the island of Willow Springs, and therefore he's never truly gone. You also see this later in the text, because now it's not a spoiler. You see this later, too, after George's death, whenever his ashes are scattered in the sound, and um, Coco goes back um, frequently to actually visit with him by talking to the water. Uh, in the sound. And so she too recognizes that George died on the island. He became a part of the island through her. And therefore he is part of this kind of haunted past and history of the island. I need another drink. Okay, enough with that passage. Um, let's move on to Mama Day's dream and her interesting interaction with the well at the other place. This occurs on pages 283 through 284. Okay, let's all turn there. Da, 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 da. Um, so I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, what I'm going to do is there's a break on the top of page 283. I'm not going to read the first paragraph after that break. I'm going to read the second paragraph, and then I'm going to stop. Uh, so Mama Day is asleep right now. She's dreaming. Daughter. The word comes to cradle what has gone past weariness. She can't really hear it because she's got no ears, or call out because she's got no mouth. There's only this sense of being, daughter, flooding through like fine streams of hot liquid sugar to fill the spaces where there was never no arms to hold her up, no shoulders for her to lay her head down and cry on, no body to ever turn to for answers. Um, I'm going to pause right there for a second. Uh, so whose daughter is Mama Day? 
she's the first Ophelia's daughter, right? And this could be um, her recognizing the loss of her mother, the loss of that maternal figure. Okay, I'm going to continue. Miranda, sister, little mama, mama day, melting, melting away under the sweet flood of waters pouring down to lay bare a place she ain't known existed. Daughter. And she opens the mouth that ain't there to suckle at the full breasts, greedy, deep greedy swallows of a thickness like cream seeping from the corners of her lips, spilling onto her chin, full, full and warm to rest between the mounds of softness, to feel the beating of a calm and steady heart. She sleeps within her sleep. To wake from one is to be given back ears, as the steady heart tells her. Look past the pain. Look past the family pain, in other words. To wake from the other is to stare up at the ceiling from the mahogany bed and to know that she must go out and uncover the well where peace died. Um, what's really interesting here is that Mama Day recognizes that she has served as a kind of maternal figure to the island. Miranda, sister, little mama, Mama Day. And then she has this melting away of that maternal role where she needs to be so strong and so mature for everyone else. And it's almost this kind of regression from her, for her. She kind of is transported back to being a little child, uh, to kind of being bathed in this warmth, almost like she's in a womb, and then of being small like a little baby and actually being breastfed. Um, and the bodies of various women are kind of overlaid here, right? So who is the woman that Mama Day dreams of being breastfed by. There's two possibilities. One is, of course, her own mother, um, the first Ophelia. The other potential answer is also that it is Sephira, um, the very first mother, right? The grand-grandmother, as we are told at one point in the novel. Um, and this, this imaginary milk that she imagines from these maternal figures, in fact, we could probably say it's both the first Ophelia and Sephira that she imagines kind of breastfeeding her. This this kind of milk is a nurturing and a knowledge that um, helps Mama Day to realize if I'm going to help to heal baby girl or Coco or the current Ophelia, it needs to start with a recognition and a healing of the past and this family trauma that we all drag around with us. And what she realizes then is that she must go out and uncover the well where her little sister Peace died. I want to go ahead and move then um, to page 284 where she actually does this. Um, so first off, she has this interesting fight where she's like ripping open, uh, the, the top of the well, um, where John Paul, her father has kind of like nailed it shut. Um, and then, uh, this is the, the second paragraph on page 284. Miranda's pulse is racing for a good many reasons as she grasps the edge of the well and peers down, a bottomless pit. Foul air hits her in the face, but she holds on to, for it to clear. Then, taking a deep breath, she looks down again, squinting her eyes to try and find the surface of the water. It's slimy and covered with floating pools of fungus when she finally makes it out. There ain't much chance of seeing through to the bottom, of even seeing her face. Peace's face. Because the sunlight is swallowed long before it reaches that far. Look past the pain. But there ain't nothing down there. And this looking is straining her eyes. Something she's not doing right. Refusing to let go of the edge, Miranda closes her eyes and stands there, her feet tangled in the ground holly, her stomach pressed against the heart-shaped ginger. And then it comes. It comes with a force that almost knocks her on her knees. She wants to run from all that screaming, echoing shrill and high, piercing her ears. But with her eyes clamped shut, she looks at the sounds. A woman in apricot homespun. Let me go with peace. That is her mother. Let me go with peace. She's So that's the first Ophelia saying that to John Paul. Let me go with peace. Let me die now that my daughter has died. And a young body falling. Peace's body, falling toward the glint of silver coins in the crystal clear water. A woman in a gingham shirtwaist, let me go with peace. Circles and circles of screaming, once, twice, three times peace was lost at that well. But how was she going to look, ever going to look past this kind of pain? 
um, that let me go with peace too uh, is something that is not only said by Ophelia, um, but that is said by Saphira Wade to Bascombe Wade. Let me go with peace. She says, stop trying to hold on to me. You have to let me go. Um, and, and we start to see that the family trauma that the days have experienced all the way back to Bascombe and Saphira is cyclical. It's repetitive. That's why so many of these women are named after each other and also why the same things keep happening over and over and over and over again. And Coco and George are just the latest iteration of this. Um, okay. Um, I want to skip over uh, what <laughs> Mama Day says um, on how George needs to save Coco other than to say that on 295 she tells him, okay, you need you need to do three things here, pal. You need to take this Bascombe Wade's ledger with you that contains Saphira Wade's bill of sale to him. You need to take this walking stick that was carved by my father, John Paul, and you need to go to my uh, chicken coop. And in the back, you're going to find a blood red hen sitting laying eggs. And you got to reach behind her and you got to pull out whatever is there and then you got to come back and bring it to me. You're like, oh, why does this matter? Um, this is a kind of ritual concerning the men. So if you think about Coco's current condition, if you think about what Sephira went through, if you think about what um, Mama Day and Abigail's mother endured, it's that they cannot find peace. Bascom Wade wouldn't let Sephira go. She couldn't find peace. Um, again, um, the first Ophelia couldn't find peace because her daughter Peace literally died. And for Coco now, that's that she has been cursed by Ruby. And so whenever George is going to carry the ledger and the cane with him, he's carrying physical objects that bring the memory of these men with him to go to the chicken coop. And he has to bring back whatever it is that he finds there. Mama Day tells him. He gets very annoyed. <laughs> um, and this occurs on pages 300 through 302. We see, we see George um, going into the chicken coop. And this is a kind of a really, really intense passage here. I'm going to skip around between pages 300, 301, and 302. So just try your best to follow along. I'm not going to read everything. I'm going to kind of jump between passages, but I am going to go in a linear manner through the text. Okay. Uh, the huge red hen seemed to be in a trance. She sat there immobile until I came within two feet of hers. <laughs> the feathers around her neck began to swell. Birds are so terrifying, you guys. As she emitted a deep throaty hiss, can you imagine being hissed at by a chicken? Oh my god. Followed by a garble set of short sounds, her throat vibrating. Her eyes never left me, and when I came within another foot, she struck. So what's really interesting is that once again, this magic, so like with the conception of Little Caesar, this really intense, important magic, um, occurs uh, in relation to chickens and specifically with a laying hen that George is now going to have to fight to get back behind her nest and he ends up cracking all of the eggs whenever he does he's trying to like get behind the nest and see and he like throws it over his shoulder and the eggs all fall and crack um, and the the chicken meanwhile the laying hen is like ripping him to shreds as this is happening chickens are ferocious um, closing living closest living relative to a T-Rex here that George is fighting. Um, and we might talk about how this is another symbol of fertility. Uh, we might think of the egg in that way as kind of a symbol of possibility. Um, the breaking of the eggs as kind of fertility or possibility destroyed or a kind of sacrifice that has to be made. Um, the eggs are shattered. Um, George ends up uh, kind of bashing all of the chickens over the head. Uh, where does it say that? This is on page 301. The air was choked with feathers. The noise was deafening. The cane broke. Oh, wait a minute. No, I'm reading too soon. 
Uh, the, oh, wait a minute. The, I'll just keep reading. The cane broke. I grabbed up the ledger and kept going until I got a stitch in my side. That finally made me stop. I looked at it all and began to laugh. A tight, airless laugh that got no further than my chest as I sank to the middle of the floor. Uh, so what he has taken is he's taken the cane and he's like started beating the chickens to death with it. And then he's taken the ledger that belonged to Bascombe Wade, whatever the cane breaks, starts beating the chickens to death with it. It's like this bloody mess and he is bloodied, he's bleeding, the chickens are bleeding, there's eggs smashed everywhere, there's all these kind of images of death, of sacrifice, of bloodletting. So George, following this, um, he goes in and he actually lays down and dies next to Ophelia because his heart condition, his heart actually bursts. Um, so the options here were that um, Ophelia dies. Uh, and what happens instead is that, again, George performs a kind of ritual sacrifice. He sacrifices the chickens, <laughs> the eggs, and himself in order to heal Ophelia. They die in her place. It's a kind of trade-off. Um, and you might be thinking, how does this restore any peace for Coco? Like, he's gone. How is that a restoration of peace? It is a restoration of peace for Coco, at least, in the sense that um, she is no longer sick. Um, how is it a restoration of peace for the other women, for Sephira, for the first Ophelia? That might be in the violent images, right? That Bascombe Wade and that John Paul were unable to either keep these women or to protect them. And it's this kind of violent, visceral lashing out that occurs through the body of George, right? And that this kind of masculine, violent frustration is taken out in this chicken coop. Um, and so these men who had been um, ineffectual in helping the women they loved, that had been kind of demasculinized, are then remasculinized? I'm not even sure if that's a word, um, through George's violent act and through the the kind of sacrifice that happens. It's it's a really a kind of awful image um, to think that uh, it's only through violence, actually, that peace is able to be restored in the novel. And, and we can certainly um, critique that notion. Okay. That's heavy. <laughs> Um, and I do want to talk about the healing of family trauma if we go to pages 308. If we go to page 308, rather. Um, I'm just going to read one paragraph here. Um, and this is the paragraph before the break on page 308. Um, so what has happened is, this is after uh, Candle Walk, later that year after George's death. Um, and uh, Mama Day has gone out to the other place, to where you can actually see the waters of the sound by herself. Miranda holds her candle in the direction of the waters that carry his or George's ashes. I can tell you now about this here night. You done, re you done opened that memory for us. My daddy said that his daddy said when he was young, candle walk was different still. It weren't about no candles, it was about a light that burned in a man's heart right? Uh, and folks would go out and look up at the stars. They figured his spirit had to be there. It was the highest place they knew. And what took him that high was his belief in right. But what buried him in the ground was the lingering taste of ginger from the lips of a woman. He's talking about Bascombe Wade here. Uh, he had freed them all but her, because, see, she'd never been a slave. And what she gave of her own will, she took away. I can't tell you her name because it was never opened to me. That's a door for the child of grace to walk through, meaning Coco. And how many, if any, of them seven sons were his or Bascombe Wade's? Well, that's also left for her to find. And you'll help her, won't you? She says to George, one day she'll hear you like you're hearing me. And there'll be another time that I won't be here for when she'll learn about the beginning of the days. But she's got to go away to come back to that kind of knowledge. And I came to tell you not to worry. Whatever roads take her from here, they'll always lead her back to you. 
Uh, what's really interesting in this passage is that we see George has kind of become one with the waters of the sound because his ashes are scattered there. Um, his voice, that first person perspective from George in the text, is actually the sound of the waves of the sound. Um, and Coco's perspective is actually her talking to the water. George becomes embodied by this figure of the natural world. He becomes another haunting presence in the island. Um, and his kind of sacrifice, this kind of blood sacrifice, this magic that he was actually able to perform has led Mama Day to actually, I thought I saw a cat over there, um, to actually better understand the family history to magically tap into the experience of Safira Wade and her own mother and be like, oh, this is what they were feeling and experiencing. Here's why it has shaped present trauma that family members who are alive are going through right now. And George has opened up a pathway for Mama Day to understand that and to heal. And he's also opened up a way for um, Coco to understand that and to heal. Another implication here is that Coco is going to become another great kind of magic user, uh, eventually like Mama Day, that she will eventually be able to hear and speak with and read the natural world, which we actually see her doing in those first person perspectives with George. Um, that, that she will be able to do that kind of work like Mama Day was doing. That she herself, again, we talked about how um, we have Safira Wade, we have Mama Day, we have Coco. They all become reflections of each other. But now, instead of being kind of tragic reflections of each other, they are reflections of each other that have been brought peace. Um, because George is finally able to take the frustration of the men in the family that came before him and release it. It has been released. That pain has been channeled. It has escaped via the slaughter of all those chickens <laughs> and of George himself. Um, yeah, Mama Day is a complicated text. Again, I think we can critique it in its use of the idea of violence um, to achieve peace. Of course, that's not the only reading there. Um, but it is one important one, I think. Um, so after this, we're moving on from Mama Day to uh, The Girl with All the Gifts, which is a zombie novel. <laughs> You'll be okay, Natalie. You really will be fine. Um, it's not that scary. Uh, so I hope you guys enjoy that and that you have enjoyed Mama Day. <laughs>